On our way here, we um, encountered a group of uh, training policemen, mm. maybe 30 or 40 guys. You know, the drill instructions. Yeah. There's something appealing about that uh, for men. Sure. Why? Esprit de corps. The what? The esprit de corps, the spirit of yeah. uh, bringing men together to accomplish something, to do something that uh, makes sense to them. Mutual support. Mm -hmm. You know, training is good. Mm -hmm. You know, men like structure. They like things to do. They like to fix things. Mm -hmm. And to be helpful. Yeah. yeah. But there's this group group spirit. Yeah. Yes, yeah. exactly. And but there's also an authority there. So we apparently we're comfortable with having being a follower and a leader. It's really helpful, especially if you have a, a good leader, someone that you feel that you can place yourself in the hands of that's going to lead you well. Mm -hmm. Following skills are you're right. Following skills are equally as, as important. Mm -hmm. Good followers mm -hmm. tend to become also good leaders. Explain that to me. I think that you need to be able to take direction. I think that you need to be able to follow uh, a skilled leader to learn your own leadership skills, to, to develop the skill sets that uh, allow you to ascend to a level of mastery, a level of competency, you know. And uh, I think leaders look in into the group and, and they, they, they look at the followers to see who shows the, the capability and the capacity to, for leadership. Do you make uh, use of these things in your retreats? Very much so. And we, all, we refer to following skills and leadership skills, being of service, servant leadership, you know. It's been thematically often very much a part of the retreats that we do the sacred, through the Sacred Path in the Men's Center of Los Angeles. Now the Sacred Path is um, the, the word Sacred Path and mm -hmm. also you refer to men as spiritual warriors. Yes. These are quite big, big words. Indeed, indeed. What justifies that? Well, you know, the interesting thing is, is that I was doing retreats for men and women uh, for four years prior to hearing my revelation, uh, the, the retreats that I was doing up at Sky High Ranch in the Upper Lucerne Valley were called Heart's Work, H-E-A-R-T-S, an acronym which stood for a healing and educational approach to relieving trauma and stress. And so I was doing retreats every couple of months, taking men and women away for the weekend to, ver to do very deep healing work. And um, I had been a psychotherapist. Well, I've been a, a therapist in private practice for 46 years now. And back in the 80s, you know, at that point, given that I uh, entered practice in 1970 uh, as a, an intern and got licensed in 72, and, um, and then started working uh, outside the office uh, in, in retreat and workshop format with men and women, had a lot of women in my life. Uh, and, you know, felt very, you know, in, in a way sort of, uh, I guess, you know, boosted by, you know, kind of the quality of the women that were actually, you know, in my practice. And of course, in the earlier days, women would, were going into therapy a lot more than men were. And so our practices in the earlier days were really much fuller, you know, with, with women. And then a lot of the women, you know, came on retreat with us. <clears throat> but I also, I mean, that's, that's, um, it's a tricky, I think for men, it's, it, you know, the contragender work is very tricky. It's because it, therapy is very intimate. And um, uh, uh, what I realized at one level of my own psychology was that it, I was a little ahead of myself in thinking that I could help women to the level or degree with which a man trying to help a woman could do without understanding really what it meant to be a man. And so I had the cart before the horse. And so in 1986, 87, I actually heard the words, the sacred path, 
just as though someone were standing behind me and saying to me, the sacred path. I'd look over my shoulder and I, 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 I you know, kind of uttered out, you know, what does that mean? And then I heard the way of the spiritual warrior, the sacred path, the way of the spiritual warrior. And I said, well, what is that? And I heard, bring good men together and bring out the best in them. And I recognized that that actually, those were my marching orders. That was a revelation that it was time for me to change course. And so I took a break at that point from working as <clears throat> intimately with women in my private practice and started really focusing on, on working with men. And I created the first Sacred Path retreat in 1987 up in a, uh, a home uh, at the top of uh, Topanga Canyon overlooking the ocean. It was owned by a fellow that was very uh, closely affiliated with Buckminster Fuller. And Bucky gave him actually the design to the geodesic dome structures, which my friend Jerry built, uh, silver geodesic dome structures at the top of Topanga. And that's where we, we held our first Sacred Path men's retreats brought 45 men together on the first retreat to sit really and to try to understand who are we? What does it mean to be a man? What are we dealing with in life today? Um, and also, what does it mean to be a spiritual warrior? My generation was our war, was the Vietnam War. Our fathers were a product of the greatest generation, World War II guys. They stepped up, showed up, and they fought the good fight for our country, came home, were proud, were received well. Men of my generation were drafted into a war that we knew was not the right war, it wasn't a moral war, it was not the war that we should be fighting. There were those that went off to war and those of us that stayed at home, uh, either because we had student deferments or, you know, 4F, you know, health issues uh, or whatever to resist the war in a way, to bring a consciousness, uh, a conscientiousness about that war. But what it did is it created a division within the generations, between the greatest generation of older men, fathers, and the younger fellows that uh, said, no, you know, this is, this is not something that we believe in. And so that, that, was, that became a very, very difficult and challenging time for men back in the 60s and 70s. And at the, at the same time, there was a women's movement that was you know, underway, where women were trying to empower themselves and to free themselves from what they referred to as patriarchal dominance. And they were organized, they were political, and they had backing. They were also trying to tell men how they should be as men. And so men were very confused. And so my generation, you know, that were in midlife at that time, which is a very confusing time anyway, to be in your late 30s and crossing over 40, were trying to determine, well, how should we be? How should we be as men? And how should we be as strong men, warrior men? You know, and the archetype of John Wayne, of the man's man. You know, a lot of, a lot of men were saying, well, is that really, you know, who we are supposed to be like? Or are there other possibilities and other options? So I think when I heard the word spiritual warrior, it made sense to me because I thought men have to be strong and they have to have something to fight for in a way. But what is the good fight? 
and what does it mean if you, you know, as Muhammad Ali, you know, who did not want to go off, you know, to war and took a stand and said, I'm not going to do that because he felt very strongly within himself about his own, you know, sense of value, standards, and, and morals. Well, other men were feeling the same. Can, can I do something in, in, you know, that makes sense and, and be a warrior in a different way? And so we, we started really looking at what does it mean to be a spiritual warrior and how do you show up in life that way? Um, you already mentioned some of the 60s and the 70s. Where are we now in the men's movement? Very good question. Where are we in the men's movement? You know, the interesting thing, too, about a men's movement, if I can just go back to, you know, what we called the men's movement in the 80s, Michael Mead, the mythologist, uh, said that he felt that we, it was more movement within men than actually a men's movement. Uh, I know Robert Bly did not really want to be uh, at the head of the men's movement. People tried to really get him to uh, accept that mantle, but he didn't really want, want that. But those elders that were there for us, for my, my generation, were Robert Bly, uh, who was you know, an outstanding poet, uh, Michael Mead, a mythologist and storyteller, James Hillman, a Jungian analyst, uh, one of the three that Carl Jung actually turned the keys over to uh, the Zurich Institute. Uh, I had the privilege of working with J. Marvin Spiegelman, one of the others of the three. He was my analyst for three years. And uh, others like Robert Moore, who is also uh, an analyst, uh, Jungian analyst in, out of Texas. Uh, Maladoma Somme, who was a Dagara shaman from the Burkina Faso area of West Africa. And, um, and then others that were more like kind of of uh, my caliber, you know, that were uh, at grassroots, uh, feeling a, a sense of uh, mission to work with men. And, and I think that because so many men were in midlife and were looking for clarity about their issues, were, were dealing with tough issues in relationships with uh, their partners, especially if their partners were women, um, and were, were seeking some guidance. And Robert Bly understood that. And so when he wrote Iron John, which was a, a, a breakout book in the 80s, he, he fashioned that after one of the, the Grimm's brothers' fairy tales. And there were many, many fairy tales, but most of them were written to, for women. I think there were only a half dozen that were written for men. Iron Hans or Iron John was a, 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 a story, a fairy tale about men that he could utilize to help men understand what it meant to be a wild man, which means essentially to be uh, fiercely assertive in a non-aggressive way, to get in touch with your non-aggressive fierceness as a man so that you could have edge, you could have boundaries and limits, and that you would know yourself well enough that you could take a stand for what you believed and take a stand on behalf of being a man. And so we would warn, we would say, if a woman says to you, for instance, you're not like other men, are you? Don't proudly agree with her. Because at some point when she realizes that you're just like all other men and she casts you out, where do you have to go if you've disenfranchised yourself from the brotherhood of man? What you need to say is you need to say, I'm very much like all men. I have my own unique ways of being and nuances of being in the world, but I'm very much like all men. And so the movement within men was really about making changes in their lives to improve themselves, to become better men, to, with the guidance of elders, of mentors. And mentors are very, very significant in the life of younger men. And that, that, that's what we were really trying to hit home 
was that mentors are different than fathers. Fathers, their responsibility is to provide for you and put a roof over your head. That's not a mentor's responsibility. A mentor's responsibility, usually a man who's 15 years older, 15 to 20 years older, is to look into your soul and to see who you are and to help to open the world to you so that you understand what your destiny is. You understand what it is that you're supposed to do you know, as a man in the world and what that means. The difficulty was a lot of people jumped onto the bandwagon of the men's movement. A lot of people, I think therapists, thought it was a bit of a cash cow, a way to actually monetize uh, their ability to develop their private practices and all. The first retreat I went to was with 129 psychotherapists up in Santa Barbara with James Hillman, Michael Mead, and Robert Bly. And then what happened was that the media picked up on it and began to create parodies of us going out into the woods, taking our shirts off, beating our chests, dancing around the fire, playing drums, beating on drums, howling at the moon, and had no real concept of what it was that we were attempting to do by going off into nature and going through processes and talking. Men need to be heard. They need to hear and to be heard. And so younger men, and actually that's what Robert Bly said, is he had more difficulty with younger uninitiated men than he did even with women at that time. And he said he never really could, could trust a man until he could look into that man's eyes and realize that he had in some ways taken his fall and climbed back up. Because our generation, you know, coming through the 60s and all, we were transcendent men. We were what John Lee referred to as flying boys, or, or James Hillman referred to as poires, Latin for uh, uh, like a Peter Pan, an uninitiated, an eternal youth. And so he said that because we were transcendent, that we were very prone and vulnerable to being a flying to the top of the mountain, and from the top of the mountain, we were very vulnerable to falling. There's a Greek word, it's called katavasis, and that's where you fall off the mountain. And what, what, what those guys said was, you, when you fall, you fall into your wound, which is where your gold is, where your genius is. So it's what you do, you know, they say the measure of, me of a man is not who he is on the way up, it's who he is on the way back up after his fall. And so you have to climb back up that mountain after you've taken that fall. But you've got to carry your gold. And he's saying, you can't, you can't just show your gold. You have to conceal it and hold it until you learn from your own wounds, from your own sense of, of internal understanding of who you are. So once the media started on, you know, 30-minute comedy shows and in the papers and magazines, poking fun at men. What happened was is that men pulled back from doing men's work because men are very subject to shame. I think so in a way much more so than women are. We're very vulnerable to shame. And when men felt the shame of going out in this uh, self-exploration or self-discovery mode, they pulled back and away, and so the bottom fell out of the men's movement in the early 90s. But there were those of us that stayed the course because we believed in men's work, and Robert said, continue to do it in, in the grassroots way. Stay home and, 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 and run your men's groups and your retreats and, uh, and continue to work and help men. Now these days, we have a lot of fellows of my generation, again, that are moving into their 70s. And we know men are dying every day. On, on, you know, there's somebody else that we hear about in their 60s. And yes, of course, the ones that, you know, are, you know, famous. David Bowie, you know, more recently now Prince.
57. Um, and men are retiring. And so the older men are, that have done a lot of their own men's work are there as elders and they're great resources for younger men. The question is how do we reach the younger men? And so we're really trying to understand what younger men are struggling with and what they're dealing with. We have Generation X men, right, that are approaching 40 now. And what we know is, is that they're dealing with very similar issues, maybe in ways much more difficult to deal with just because of the changes in culture and society uh, as they cross over their 40s. Their relationships are in trouble. There's a lot of infidelity out there. And um, because, you know, of the uh, the openness to society now and culture, you know, it's a lot easier to sort of explore in ways because a lot of those parameters and, and sort of, you know, boundaries and limits that were more in place at one time are not there, which gives more opportunity for people to uh, get into trouble. <laughs> I always say that, you know, men that are in their around 40 have enough energy, you know, to get into trouble and to get out of trouble. But older men who are in their late 50s and in their 60s and all still have enough energy to get into trouble, but you better start thinking about how much energy it takes to get out of trouble. That's where older men can be of help to the younger fellows. So through social media and an understanding of what young men uh, in their teens, in their 20s, in their 30s are grappling with, if we can reach them, to explain what it is that the elders explained to us and allowed us to deal with and come to terms with. And we are those elders now that are there for the younger fellas. And so after doing this for 30 years now and having a core group of men in my community that want to give back the outreach is very important, and that's what, what we're fundamentally, you know, really trying to get clear is how do we reach these younger men so that we can help them make those transitions through their life uh, in ways so that, uh, you know, they don't have to hit quite so hard when they take their fall. What can the younger men do for the older men? Vitality. Uh, reminding us the importance of being youthful, the importance of uh, staying involved technologically, not falling behind, uh, being involved through music, through the arts, theater, cinema, television, uh, the social media, that, that phenomena of expansion when the word is spread to all corners of the earth. You know, we're in that period of time now. But younger men um, have this, um, this, 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 this sense of vigor and vitality and energy. And so for older men being around the younger men, it reminds them to stay healthy, be strong, be fit, eat well, get enough sleep, and enjoy life. You know? So you're a psychotherapist. Men uh, phone you when things are not going so well. Yes. That's one way that they get into practice. Yeah. Um, we would say that um, uh, Men would traditionally get into practice as a result of a woman uh, saying, we're going to therapy. <laughs> and a lot of times men very reluctantly found themselves in a therapist's office. Um, when I got licensed back in the 70s, 82% of psychotherapists were women. Today, it's about 92 or 93% of psychotherapists are women. What we know is that women are going to college and matriculating through college, going on into professional schools, uh, whether it be medicine or law or, you know, whatever, uh, at a much higher rate than men. 
very different than coming after World War II. A lot of, or after the Depression, actually. But a lot of men went in, 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 into universities and colleges. That's not the case now. And so um, when a man would traditionally get into therapy over the past several years, it would be mostly with a woman, which is fine. It's fine, especially if the woman therapist really understands men, and especially if she doesn't have her own issues or agenda to inflict on a man, even unwittingly. Uh, we had a lot of women, for instance, that, you know, it used to be women, you know, when there was a divorce, you know, people would come out and women would go out and go into real estate or something when they left a marriage. A lot more women now go, you know, become therapists. And they treat it a little bit as a cottage industry. Uh, and if they're not completely resolved with uh, the man that they were married to or if their own issues, if they were, you know, we, we, we do understand and know that uh, often, you know, women have issues with men. And we know that, you know, one out of three women will be abused by a man, uh, you know, and often violently. And so if a woman is not completely healed and resolved within herself and she's trying to work with a man, then sometimes she could be part of the problem, not part of the solution. We understood that it was very important for men at a particular time, especially to be with a man in therapy. Women therapists that understand that can be very helpful, especially if they do really good work and then they say, now it's time for you to go work with a man. Or for a male therapist who's, who does very good work and says, it's time for you to go work with a woman therapist now, you know, to work on your mother issues, for instance, unresolved issues. So I wanted to uh, train more men to be therapists that would work with men. In 1987, we did the first Sacred Path Men's Retreat, as I had said, and then in 1988, I founded the Men's Center of Los Angeles. In 1992, we opened the corporate offices. We had an internship program. We had six interns. And, uh, and I, I was also teaching. I taught at USC. I taught for nine years at a, a smaller college in the clinical psychology department, Recon College, where I was teaching practicum and really helping people to understand what, you know, what men's issues are and how do you deal with those therapeutically so that a man would feel safe. So if a man is pulled into therapy, I've had, I had a number of men that, that would come to me and they would say, you know, I, I went into therapy, you know, with my wife, with a woman therapist, and he said, I felt ganged up on. I said, well, okay, why? He said, I don't know. He said, I just felt that that therapist was kind of in my wife's corner and, uh, and I was alone, you know, and I, I also, he'd say, often I, I felt that that therapist had her own issues as well. And I said, well, okay. Then we had women that were, were, you know, calling and saying, Dr. Johnson, you know, maybe they read about me in the back of somebody's book or something, you know, one of the books on men that were coming out. You know, I, I, my husband's a good man. He just needs some guidance. I, you know, I, I'd really like to come in. You know, because I think it's important that we, 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 we sit with a man, a male, rather than a female therapist. And um, my practice shifted dramatically. My, I mean, I work primarily with men. I have a full-time practice. I like working with women. I don't try to work with all women like I did at one point when I was younger and more naive. Um, I try to stay within the scope of what I feel I can do best. You know, we're keys for certain locks. We can unlock every lock. But if we're the right person for the job, we can usually be helpful. And so, you know, when you know what you can do and you can do it well, then, you know, satisfied customers are your best referral source. So I like working with men. And a lot of times, you know, all day, it's just men that I'm working with. The women I work with, I think, also, you know, have a, a good sense of, of balance in their lives, and so that I find very invigorating. I like working with adolescents, both males and females. One time I used to say, no, I'm not going to work with a, a young gal that has an eating disorder or a young gal that's cutting, but then I'd have people I worked with that would, you know, insist, if, you know, that I would work with their kids, and then I, I learned that I actually could be effective. There are certain things I, I don't do, you know, that I'm not, you know, not my specialty. But uh, 
you know, doing men's work is um, very rewarding because uh, to make a difference in, in the life of a man and see that man change and uh, show up in ways that, you know, are mindful uh, to save his marriage and uh, help him to navigate through the very challenging waters that are out there these days. Uh, it's very gratifying. An apple a day keeps the doctor away. What can men do by themselves to keep you away as far as possible? Mm. Well, I think that if a man is curious about life and is open to learning, there is a multitude of things that he can do, ways of learning. Uh, the internet provides tremendous resources. And uh, through reading, through observation, through involvement, uh, men's groups, there are men's groups out there that are uh, not run by therapists, but that are, you know, we, we say leaderless, but in a way, uh, they're all leaders, you know, and they gather together to hold each other's feet to the fire, to be accountability partners, um, to s be therapeutically supportive, even if it's not run as a therapy support group. And so I do believe that therapy is an educational process. One does not need to be mentally ill. One does not need to have, you know, major mood disorder, personality disorder to benefit from therapy. I, in fact, run my practice as a mentor therapy practice. And so the men that I work with often refer to me as their mentor, um, as a guide. And even though I'm a, a clinical professional and I do need to understand enough about uh, the DSM uh, and the diagnostic uh, categories and I, I do hospitalize people and I do refer people for medication and I do deal with some very 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 difficult uh, situations but I also run groups I have three groups that I run I had five at one time we do the major retreats twice a year we do workshops and and seminars and colloquiums and practicums and so I think that self-care and someone who does a lot of their own self-exploration and goes off and maybe does Landmark Forum or uh, the you know, Mankind Project or the Sterling Workshops or any, any of these, these good quality retreats and workshops and conferences that are there get a lot of value you know, from that. And, and it's, it's very therapeutic. Are there any of these uh, programs that have beliefs that you disagree with? I mean, Sterling is very different than Mankind Project. Well, the thing about the Sterling Weekend uh, is that, you know, Justin Sterling came out of uh, EST, you know, and uh, there were a few generals uh, under Werner that uh, took off and, and created their own. My understanding is that Sterling, I think, did something for women before he did the Sterling Men's uh, uh, Weekend. And um, at the time that Justin was doing his work and I was doing my work, uh, his was fundamentally what I what I you know gathered and heard from men that. Uh, were working with him was it was like you know kind of find your balls you know find your manhood uh, be able to plant your, your feet and a lot of it I think was also dealing with the difficulties of uh, the male female relationship and the the impact of the power of strong women in, in, in a man's life I say that you know these days I, I find that men tend to feel that they live in the Queen's castle they go off to work where maybe they feel more like the king. But when they come home, women, you know, basically 
uh, are running the in the, the typical kind of relationship. Even though I know that many women are working outside the house, we I have many men in my practice that are stay-at-home fathers. But where men go off and where women are staying home to a certain degree and providing for that stay-at-home parenting and this and that and running of the house, men oftentimes would come home and feel like, like they were in the queen's castle. So how can they experience you know, their own kingship? As Robert Moore talked about, the four archetypes of the mature masculine, the king, the warrior, and the lover, and the magician. So um, uh, what we would do is we, we would you know, try to help men to understand how to create that balance you know, in their life so that uh, they, they, they could you know, find uh, the way of showing up at work, showing up at home you know, as well. You already mentioned uh, parenting. Let's uh, talk about fathers and, uh, and sons. Um, when I was a kid, I needed a very different type of father than when I was an adolescent or mm -hmm. now, you know, being a young adult or uh, I'm 39 now. So I need, again, a different type of father. Mm -hmm. What can you say about these different roles? Of fathering, of the, the different fathers that we, we need as we develop and as we move through our life? Well, I think that's true. Uh, my father uh, was a typical, you know, greatest generation guy who came home from the war and uh, jumped into the great American dream and went off to work and uh, was living the good life, you know, into the 40s and into the 50s and all. But they were not very comfortable. Not only did they not talk about what went over, what went on in the war, but they weren't very comfortable about accessing their feelings and their emotions or talking about things that that uh, young fellas uh, needed to talk about. And so we often went to our moms. Our moms were there for us. And so we, to a certain degree, we, we could say we were kind of mama's boys raised by our mothers because our fathers were very busy, you know, being uh, men that were, you know, of that generation, you know, who were the ones that fundamentally were... Uh, guiding men, uh, you know, well, was, you know what, John Wayne, Frank Sinatra, people like this, you know, and so this is like, you know, what it means to be a man. So, so um, it, it was helpful to have older men create venues and opportunities for younger men to come together. My father, because he wasn't there, but he also, he didn't, you know, for me in ways that I needed, but he, he didn't also quash me. I mean, he didn't, you know, uh, he gave me a, a certain amount of permission to develop mentorship relationships with other men. And so throughout the years, uh, even perhaps each decade, I would find someone, whether it was a coach, whether it was a teacher, a uh, professor, uh, or, you know, whoever, that I could learn from. And so it seemed that, and we would say to men, we'd say, look, even though you're older and you haven't had a relationship with a mentor when you were younger, it doesn't really matter, you know. There are men out there that really would love to be there for you. What we know is, is that men who are retired and men who are older often are lonely. They don't have the relationships that they had when they were younger. A lot of times their friends are dead, their friends have moved away, uh, but they wind up just primarily in a relationship, if they're still married, you know, with their wife and not having men in their lives. And so having a community, for instance, uh, of where you can go and plug in and have men in your life that you can be with and, and, and can, as Robert Bly would say, provide father food for you so that it would nurture you and nourish you by being in the presence of other men. Uh, and that's what I think is really important about men's community is for older men to know that there are men there for them, even if those friends that they went to high school with or whatever are not there for them. And they can become isolated and uh, very lonely and depressed. And this gives them opportunities to avoid that. Much has been written about um sons with father issues. Do you talk to fathers with son issues? Yes. You know, 
the father wound, essentially men's work really sort of focused on, from the get-go, on the father wound. And, um, and so men were looking, obviously, at how they had been wounded by their fathers. We were looking at the father who is missing in action, goes out of a son's life, or the father who is heavy-handed and goes over the top and crushes a young fellow's spirits. Uh, in a certain way, the father that stays present uh, and may be uh, dominant uh, is an easier wound to deal with than the father that abandons the son, where the son feels rejected and lost and did not have the father. And the shame that one carries as a result of having a father that leaves. Many men would say, well, my father left my mother. Why? Because he felt she was crazy. But does he think that she got any saner after she left? No. He left me with my mother who got even crazier because she had been abandoned by him, left by him. So a lot of young fellows, those wounds were, got, got even deeper because then they were having to contend with mothers that were really bereft because of you know, being wounded also by that man you know, that left. So sons can wound fathers. But you know, Robert Bly said it's, it's almost impossible for a father not to in some way wound his son. Uh, a father who blesses a son and allows that prince to feel that he can ascend to the throne of his own kingship makes a tremendous difference. A father who does not bestow a blessing or a father that even curses the son in one way or another wounds that son very deeply. Many men, no matter what their age chronologically, often do not feel like they're a man. I've worked with men in their 80s that have accomplished a lot in the world that still confided to me that they did not feel like they were a man. These days, it's almost like a phenomenon with millennials that we find a lot more young people that are sort of divorcing their parents. Their parents are, are considered to be toxic or, uh, you know, whatever but they just decide that they're divorcing. So uh, if you think about the wound that a son can deliver, if a son, for instance, uh, through his own perception or the story that he tells or whatever it is that's going on with him, decides that he's going to uh, kick off hard during his own individuation process, it's really interesting to try to understand, you know, why, why does it seem to be uh, so difficult these days? Is it that uh, parents and their kids were so much closer that, you know, kids would go off to college and then they would come home and move back in with their parents. And because, you know, we were communicating more and we had closer relationships, it just makes that individuation process that much harder, you know, that they have to kick off in order to be able to create a momentum to get away and, you know, cut the cord. I'm not quite sure. I think that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we're studying and we'll try to understand more of this as time goes, you know, on uh, with, with the generation. But this seems to be more of a phenomenon that's taking place now with millennials that I guess are somewhere, what is that, 13 to 30 or, th you know, 31. It's kind of that, that range, you know. So, but yes, it's a two-way, you know, it's, what do we say? It's like the uh, a two-way, two uh, the sword that's all blade, you know, in a way that... Uh, that uh, that wound can cut from both sides. You talk about the millennials um, in Vancouver, and I noticed them here in LA too. We have millennials men with a man bun. Yeah. This is a female hairstyle. Mm -hmm. What's going on? You know, I don't know. I mean, you know, my generation put our hair back in ponytails. Uh, you know, we grew our hair long. Uh, we didn't tattoo. We pierced our ears. You know, we, we'd wear an earring. Um, rites of passage, marks of initiation, and much more 
in the recent years do we see many more tattoos on people, men and women, and piercings. And, uh, and so I, th I think that, that we're seeking our own rites of passage, or young pe younger people are seeking their own rites of passage, and creating some kind of marks of demarcation uh, from saying, maybe it's, it's, it's just another expression of, ca of the counterculture, of saying, you know, I'm not like you. You know, uh, I'm, I'm unique. Uh, I, am, uh, I am my own person. With hairstyles, we see so much, you know, I mean, people are, you know, coloring their hair, you know, blues and pinks and all different kinds of things. And, and, uh, and, and men are putting their hair up, you know, in styles that, you know, are also characteristic of the warrior because if you think of the samurai, samurais wore hair buns, you know, men buns or whatever you, you know. But I think it's 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 a process of individuation, of uh, of uh, it's it's artistic, it's creative. I mean, you know, we, we we just lost Prince, and and we say, well, not only was Prince the genius, and was 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 he a brilliant musician, you know, but he. He defined, like David Bowie did, style, you know? And, uh, and it's very interesting that so many, I think, of the very talented musicians uh, that have, have played such a, an important part on shaping culture are, are, are almost androgynous, you know? So it, we're, we're in a time where we're dealing with um, you know, with trying to understand, well, what does it mean to be a transgender? What is going on with, with you know, with, with gender identification or, uh, you know, gender confusion? And, uh, and can a man still be a man uh, if he dresses a particular way, uh, if he shows up, you know, uh, not looking like men traditionally, you know, do? So... We sit in a lot of questions right now because there's so much going on, so many possibilities for us to try to interpret and define. Uh, I bet that in your uh, retreats or in the men's group there's sometimes resentment amongst the men. Yes. Is that good? Is that, help? Is that an opportune moment? Yes, it is. You know, what I learned uh, in going, especially up when, when we would go to the Mendocino Men's Conferences, which was the, old, the oldest, well, I say the oldest, but you know, it's, that was the, the first real conferences that were done with those guys, with Robert Bly and all, and up in Mendocino, deep in the forest for six days. Usually it was about 120 men. And every day at 4 o'clock they would have conflict hour where we would all gather <clears throat> in the community room for conflict. And the conflict could be <clears throat> quite something. And for men that grew up in homes, being on the front lines without a, fox, a foxhole, maybe they grew up in an alcoholic home, a rageaholic home, just being around conflict could be devastating. Some men, it would be so hard to even be in the room in the presence of conflict, let alone to be part of the conflict. But as Carl Jung said, that the, you know, that the measure of a mature individual, of a balanced and uh, actualized, you know, which is Abraham Maslow's word, individual is the ability to hold opposites in both hands without being torn apart like a lightning rod. And so what we came to understand was is that, the, that we, we have to be able to not be conflict avoidant, but to be able to sit in conflict, to not lose our voices in conflict, to maintain our voices, to speak to it. We had to understand the difference between being enraged and outraged. The, the understanding that rage essentially with men is a combination of anger plus shame, that when men are shamed when they're young, their heads drop, and they inculcate that wound in such a way that at some point it's going to come out as rage, which is very physical. 
John Lee, in his book, Facing the Fire, spoke a lot about anger, men and anger, and, and, and how anger uh, can be effective if it's used in a way that uh, makes a difference. Like outrage can be effective. We need healthy outrage. Without outrage, terrible things happen. Without enough outrage, things happen, like the Holocaust, for instance. And so we need, we need to know the difference between being enraged and like just a rageaholic, uh, road rage, etc., and the ability to channel that passion into being able to take a stand for something that's important. So being in conflict in men's community and not losing yourself, but finding more of who you are in the presence of that is very valuable. There's a large group of men that we can reach. Any ideas? We're very concerned about the, the men that are in their early to mid 30s uh, that go, you know, from up, up to 45 years of age, white males that may or may not have high school educations but didn't go on into college. A lot of these uh, fellows that are, may, are out of work, they live in parts of this country, whether it's uh, Detroit, Flint, Michigan, or uh, other areas where commerce has moved out, and so they're out of work. Uh, maybe it was the auto industry is, is a good you know, example in, in Detroit. Uh, they're angry. And because of that, they're drinking heavily, they're using uh, drugs, illicit drugs, if you will, as well as painkillers. And uh, we know we have an epidemic in this country now of uh, opioid, opioid use, abuse, that leads to heroin uh, use. And um, these fellas are dying at rates that exceed those of African Americans and Hispanics. The question is, how do we reach them? Because the men that will naturally, organically navigate to men's work tend to have, are, are typically college educated uh, or have, you know, education beyond college. And so, how do we reach them because they tend to believe that the kind of work that we're doing as men when we gather as men to do this work is not really manly and uh, it's threatening to them. And so we have to show up in ways that demonstrate. That. I, I remember uh, I was doing a, the, this one retreat uh, and uh, we used this venue and uh, the woman that essentially uh, let us come in to use this, this retreat center, Holy Spirit Retreat Center, uh, said, you know, we mostly have women that come here for our programs. She said, it's really nice to have men here. And then she, she, she looked at me and she said, and also men that are so masculine. You know? And I think that men need to look at a man that he can identify with and understand that that man is showing some vulnerability w in a way that, that allows him to touch his emotions and his feelings and his sensitivities, that that in and of itself takes great strength. The ability to cry, for instance. Now we know that laughter and tears come from the same place. And the importance of humor in reaching men, zaniness. So I always tell jokes, and I tell off-color jokes at these retreats to get men laughing. Because when they laugh and they open up at something that's irreverent, it allows entree into the depth of their, the sacredness of what they hold uh, in those hallowed chambers, of what they hold as sacred within themselves, whatever that is. Maybe it's something that they've never told anyone. I've had men, for instance, that have told me secrets that they've carried for years, or I've had men in my presence that when their fathers died when they were young, they didn't cry. 
because maybe they were 12 or 13, their father died, and then their uncle said, you're now a man, you know, and so you've got to be the man of the family. I've had men that were in their 40s, 50s, or older that cried and sobbed with me as though they were standing once again at their father's funeral, you know, and they never had the opportunity to do that. So for fellows that don't cry, that, uh, like Henry David Thoreau said, the mass of men live lives of quiet desperation. And that's true. Men suffer silently. And so we're always looking to see how do we reach them. We've brought homeless men to our retreats. We've brought, brought men out of, freshly out of prison to our retreats. Men that want to transform their lives. These are good men that wound up in conflict and conduct disorder uh, because they were angry and they didn't have the guidance and so they lost their way. But now they want to find their way. They want to find their own sacred path. And so we've done a lot of programs where we've brought those fellows and we've done programs where we bring young fellows in from the inner city here in Los Angeles from South Central and Compton and East LA, Watts, that don't have fathers, you know. Um, it's really, really very difficult for these young fellows that grow up in gang territory to avoid being in a gang. They have to be in a gang for survival, uh, for protection. And so we, we try to really help as best we can. We like working with, with the young guys when we can get them when they're 12 and 13 before they get into the gangs and to create pathways for them to avoid gangs or to get them out of the gangs, get them through high school, get them on to college. Uh, we have some remarkable young fellas that are now in college that we've worked with um, that, uh, are, that have, they are survivors and they are invictors. They're not victims and, you know, they're, they're making headway now. It's very tempting to consider that we have a masculine and a feminine side, you know. Uh, certainly that's relatively indisputable and we can go with that, you know, r relatively easily. The difficulty that we had when we were doing men's work back in the 80s was brought up again by Robert Bly who said, why is it that the more positive attributes of a, a male are attributed to the feminine side and the more negative characteristics of a male are attributed to his masculine side. And he said, why don't we refer to it as conscious masculinity, the consciously masculine side, which allows one to be more open and vulnerable and to be able to access the dimensions of his psyche. And we all, you know, really needed to think about that and, and, and grapple with that because those of us that were involved with the men's movement were actually feminists. We were the ones that supported the women in their movement in the 60s. And so, because so many of us had been feminists, and then we came to the realization that some of the women's, women's movement was really not very supportive of what we were doing and who we were as men, it created even more confusion, you know, for us. Now, you know, there were different factions of the women's movement. I mean, there were those that were really, really angry about, you know, uh, patriarchal dominance, you know, male subjugation, for instance. But I remember Herb Goldberg saying to me, and he wrote a book called The Hazards of Being Male. It was one of the very first books that, that was written. And Herb said, I never wrote that, you know, to, to, I wasn't thinking about a men's movement. He said, I was just really pissed off coming out of a marriage. And he said, I had to just write a rant, 
<laughs> and he said, but I picked, but so many men picked it up and, and, and they, you know, they, they gravitated to it and they felt that I was saying something to them that, that made, made sense, you know. And he said, you know, the interesting thing about the women's movement is he said, I knew many of those women that were, you know, at, you know, the, the top of that movement, leaders in that movement. And he said, you know, why did it seem that they were so angry about men? And he said, what I realized was they were angry because they had very dominant mothers and passive fathers. And they were angry because their fathers didn't actually stand up to their mothers. And he said, that was very enlightening, you know. So I think that, um, that men, when they're looking to see what it means to be a balanced male, what I, I refer to as being a mindful man, you know, and uh, if we think of mindfulness in and, and the way that Dr. John Kabat-Zinn defined it, you know, at the University of Massachusetts about 40 years ago when he brought Vipassana meditation together with cognitive behavioral therapy and referred to it as secular med meditation. And he said mindfulness is essentially being aware in the present moment in a relaxed way, uh, not exercising judgment as in condemnation, but judgment as in wise discernment. That a balanced male or a mindful man is a balanced individual who's able to exercise discernment or wisdom uh, that allows him to be himself and feel comfortable with himself. To not be seeking approval, to be off of the approval-disapproval syndrome, to self-validate and to allow himself, no matter how it is that he comes across in the world, whether he would be defined by others as being uh, more uh, on the feminine side than the masculine side, but yet feels very secure within himself in terms of being a man, that, that he's able to essentially have a nervous system that is uh, undisturbed when it comes to his being himself in the world. I'd like to get back to what you said a moment ago about uh, being vulnerable and the strength that it takes to be vulnerable. The biggest debate that I have encountered in, in men's groups is disagreement. Half thinks that no, we shouldn't show our vulnerability to our women. Mm -hmm. And the other said, what are you talking about? That's so important. Mm -hmm. What's your position? It depends. I think that uh, one has to, first of all, decide the level of safety. Vulnerability essentially means capable of being wounded. You know, it's my hands are nowhere near my gun or my sword. I am open. I am capable of being wounded by you if that's what you chose. What we know is in uh, partnership that intimacy are two people that are able to be safely vulnerable with each other. The key word is safe. Safely vulnerable with each other. Open to uh, explore uh, the truth, their truth, uh, you know, whatever, to thine own self be true, whatever one is feeling like uh, is an expression of their honest self, you know. In a relationship, a man in relationship with a woman, for instance, can further her sense of security or he can diminish it. A man in relationship with a woman who is secure, which is her responsibility, is her own sense of security. His responsibility is, you know, if he wants to obviously be a champion of that relationship, is to be all in and to, to know that what she needs is him to need her without being needy to be able to depend on her without being dependent on her. An insecure woman will have a much more difficult time with a man who is secure because in his security, self-assurance, she will tend to feel less secure about herself. 
I find men often uh, go above and beyond the call of duty to try to make a woman feel secure so that she's easier to live with. Many men will tell me about being in a relationship with a woman where they feel like they're walking on eggshells. In my book, I talk about different types of uh, relationships, different types of characteristically of men and of women, and how they come together uh, to collaborate either on a relationship that is going to go up and over or down and out, which could be their downfall or could actually champion them in a way that allows them to grow. When a man gets himself involved with a woman who is insecure or a woman who has been uh, traumatized, abused in some way, possibly she has features of borderline personality disorder, uh, then uh, he's typically going to be in a push-pull relationship where it's going to be very, very difficult for him to be able to be himself completely and in, in a fulfilled way in her presence. And therefore, he will not be able to be safely vulnerable. If he is vulnerable, he will usually suffer because it, uh, it doesn't go smoothly. And so what I help men to do is to understand the qualities of a good relationship. What are you looking for in a mate? And so I say, make a list of all the characteristics and qualities that you're looking for in your perfect mate. Now what we do is we pick 10 out of those. And then I say, cherry pick and give me your five desert island qualities, those that, you, that are unalterable, non-negotiable. And then I work with them to help them to understand what those are. Because I say, when, you're, when you have the opportunity to choose someone, and choice is very important, the ability to choose. We either you know, choose in, choose out, and even not to choose is a choice. But when, when, when you can design and understand what you're looking for and how to vet that person, if you will, to really determine who that person is, and is this the, the, the quality of, of, of a companion and a mate, you know, does this, per has, does this person have a lot of excess baggage? Has this person been badly wounded? What am I trying to do? Save her? Rescue her? You know? And so I really enjoy working, especially with younger fellows that, are, that come to me for premarital counseling because they say, I don't want to make a mistake here. I, I really want to choose wisely. You know? Then we, we begin with, well, who are you? You know, who are you and how do you show up in your life uh, and what is it that you're looking for that's really going to enhance your life going forward? Is there any unexplored territory for us in men's work? I suspect that... Um, that which is on the horizon today has a lot to do with gender. You know, they refer to, I'm, I'm a member of Division 51 of the American Psychotherapy, excuse me, American Psychological Association, which is the study of men and masculinities, plural, masculinities. And so we are now on the horizon of looking at the impact of gender and what does that mean, you know? Uh, in terms of uh, LBGT uh, and uh, homophobia and uh, the masculinities that run the gamut. And so I think that, that that's, the, 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 if you will, we're, we're headed out into space, you know, and conquering new uh, lands, new areas of exploration. And I think that that's probably one of the more important ones these days. Because when, for instance, uh, you've got the issue of can a transgender go, use either bathroom that he or she wants to use, and what's the impact and uh, uh, 
influence on people's sensibilities around that. It's a big stretch for people now to try to understand how do we accommodate the, the, the permission now for there to be an expression of much greater possibilities within one's life. So, um, on college campuses, and of course college campuses tend to be more feminized uh, than, you know, they've had women's studies departments. Very rarely do we have a men's study department, though we have through Division 51 a desire to create much more of an understanding about gender and uh, masculinities uh, and who men are in the world. And there are different models of addressing that you know, these days. But uh, I think that that's, that's the attention that a lot of the people that are very much interested in the more academic area of uh, men's work, men and, and gender, and uh, self-expression. Are there places of inspiration uh, that we can use that we haven't looked at yet? Areas of inspiration. I'm going to go back to Prince again because they asked Prince, uh, how do you categorize your music? And he said, I don't really like categories, but I think if we needed to come up with something, I want my music to be inspirational. Right? So I think that what does it mean to, to be an inspired individual, to inspire someone? It means to breathe life into. It means to be vigorous and vital. Um, spirituality and uh, the opportunities for people to learn from um, teachers and different philosophies. So many people that were raised in religions, especially if they were more fundamentalist, that felt confined and restricted. Uh, that are not following those early paths, but are seeking other dimensions. What we know is a lot of people, you know, have fallen away from, you know, anything where they felt that they were in, in constricted to be, you know, a follower, that they didn't choose to be at some point in their life. And so more people, you know, say, well, I don't, I, I don't believe in God, I'm an atheist, or maybe I'm an agnostic, and so I'm kind of seeking, you know, to understand, you know, whether there is, there, there isn't, or, you know, I, I'm a spiritual person, whatever that means, you know, to that person. Uh, they say, I'm not into dogma uh, or religion, but, you know, I, I, I feel that it's important to be a humanist and uh, spiritual. I think that, that, that there's a lot of opportunities there, you know, for us to learn. And uh, the more that uh, we're open to that, and the more, I say, you know, a lot of the people that, that are on the sac in our community, in the sacred path, I, I say, you know, fellas, I said, we're like monks without a monastery. I said, we're mystics. I said, why? Because we're interested. I, and, I, and, you know, if somebody says to me, my kids have said to me, you know, Dad, you're weird. And I say, thank you. Well, Dad, why would you say that? And I said, because metaphysically to be weird means that you see through the veil. It means that you are willing to be extraordinary, not just ordinary. That you're willing to understand things that um, are sort of outside the box, that are, that are beyond, you know, just what we can see directly in front of us. And there's so much out there now. I have a rocket scientist in my, in my practice, you know, who, uh, uh, which is so fascinating to me, you know, because, you know, he's sending up the rockets these days that, you know, are potentially, uh, eventually going to be manned and go to Mars. You know, so we're, we're, uh, we're really on the, I think, on the threshold of some incredible scientific and medical breakthroughs and uh, philosophical uh, expansions in our thinking. Um, these are exciting times, you know, that we're living in. What about uh, the animal kingdom? 
in the animal kingdom. Well, you know, the Shaolin monks study the animals. That, that's where, you know, the Taoists uh, developed, you know, the martial arts. They watched water. They watched the flow of water, and they watched how animals move. There's a lot that we can learn from, I think, the animal kingdom. Uh, you know, there's so much intelligence out there if we're willing to really uh, study it and support it. We started off in, in men's work in the mythopoetic end of things. Robert Bly was a poet, Michael Mead, a mythologist, James Hillman, a Jungian, you know. And so we always use stories. We used stories and we use stories. We tell stories. And we have great storytellers and they drum and they tell the story. And we ask, we say, where do you identify with the story? What elements of this particular story capture you? Because it's a great way for, into men's ability to communicate. If a man can see himself in a story and speak to whatever's going on with him by talking about the story, one removed allows for entree for him to then go deeper you know, within himself. You mentioned uh, cultures a moment ago. Are you noticing big difference between Asian men, uh, men from indigenous cultures, uh, Europeans, in how they uh, show up in, in, the, in the men's programs? Yes, there is a big difference. Unfortunately, we don't have many Asian men that have done men's work. Um, fundamentally, men's work was white European males coming together. And I remember when Michael Mead said, uh, it's time for us to now branch out and start working with other ethnicities. And that's when he created Mosaic Men's, multicultural men's work, and started working with gang members. And we, we brought in Luis uh, Rodriguez and uh, Maladoma Somme and, and other, other men from other cultures. Um, you know, there, there are, Asian men, you know, that do this work, but um, it's been much more difficult, you know, for us to attract uh, them, They're, including into therapy. You know, they, they have a different system uh, around honor and what's honorable and what's not honorable. And uh, they, they tend to be a little closer to the vest uh, uh, than, but, you know, the like if you look at the Promise Keepers, which is the Christian end of the men's movement, that's very um, uh, interracial, you know, very uh, mixed. And, um, but uh, fundamentally, you know, again, at the core of that, at the heart of that, is Christianity. So there always has to be something that's central. Why are we doing this and what is central to, uh, to the path that we're on, you know? And um, if it's a little too obscure, then it's more difficult. Men don't surrender to nothing very easily. We have to surrender to something if we're going to let go, you know. And, and it, has to, it has to have some meaning. It's got to be, in a way, something that we can, if we're asked, we, we can talk about and, and document. Are there women that really inspire you? Certainly. Who? Yeah. Well, um, I guess I need to look at categorically or sort of, you know, what, uh, what area, you know, you know, we're speaking about. I guess the first woman that comes to my mind is my mother. She was very inspirational. She was, um, she grew up on the banks of the Wabash River and she was a tomboy. And, um, she became a New York model who was essentially invited to become the poster girl for the uh, U.S. bonds during World War II. And so 96 million posters had her picture on them, and her posters hung in the 
lockers of all of the GIs uh, that were uh, overseas. She was the first woman that was allowed across enemy lines to go over and to visit the hospitals. She visited hospitals, you know, here of the returning vets, but also w w was there. She went over on the ba Bon Cavalcade of Stars to entertain the troops. And uh, uh, she made such an impression on them that even Eleanor Roosevelt felt that uh, she had was making the boys feel homesick, so she was going to try to <laughs> you know, keep her from being able to uh, be that voice of, uh, you know, the girl, the girl next door. But uh, fortunately, uh, you know, Washington was able to, you know, uh, continue to allow her, you know, to do that. But she came home and she was uh, a very, very, very powerful figure in my life. And uh, I always had a, a great appreciation for what she taught me about being a strong, balanced, powerful, charismatic, kind, caring woman. Uh, my dad was very fortunate, you know, to uh, have met her. Uh, she was actually, he was uh, under Eisenhower's command and uh, was in charge of the uh, entertainment for the Allied forces. And so when my mother went over, uh, he was her chaperone, and they fell in love and got married in Paris before the end of the war. So I was pretty, uh, you know, fortunate to have two wonderful, you know, parents. But I, I, you know, when I ask men, I say, what is the, at the top of your list, what would you say in a woman would be that desert island quality, if you had one quality? And men tell me all sorts of things. And they don't necessarily name what it is that I pinpoint, but I get tremendous agreement when, once I do. And so I'll ask this maybe, you know, in, in a conference or something. And then I'll say, what about sweetness? And then everybody goes, oh, yeah, yeah, sweetness. And I say, so that if there were only one quality that you wanted to assure was there, in the woman in your life, it would be sweetness. You know, it's it's like kindness, you know, but people get it. The guys get it, you know, and so some of the women I guess that um, I've you know thought have been you know pretty neat may not necessarily have been always as sweet, but I think that they've had also. Uh, I've seen glimmers of that. You have, there has to be empathy and compassion and kindness there. Uh, the women that um, seem to appreciate men and uh, enjoy men, uh, men's sense of humor and can hang with men, uh, the kind of gal that can maybe uh, get up and be outdoors in the morning and do something that's uh, uh, very physical and then put on an evening gown and, you know, run the gamut from, uh, as you said, you know, being somewhat of a tomboy or being able to do things and hang with the guys, you know, get on a horse and ride or whatever. At the same time, you know, be someone who's also very feminine. That's what I like. Because, you know, I say to fellas, look, you know, we change hormonally as we age. And, of course, you know, women want, uh, they, when they get involved with a fellow, they look at a guy and they, they look at him as a prospect, you know, and they look to see what it is that they can do to improve that fellow. So they want to change him for the better. Men look at a woman and they like her just the way she is and they would really prefer that she not change. The irony of it is, is that we all change to a certain degree. Women are going to change. Uh, men are going to change, but maybe they don't change in the way the woman would want. So there she's invested in trying to bring out the best in this fella, and, and he's not really, you know, signing up for the program. Where a woman can uh, influence a fella in a good way and bring out the best in him it makes a difference. But men have to allow for the changes in a woman 
men have to, you know, women, women go through stages. They, they go from the maiden stage to the matron stage to the crone stage. And men like women to stay uh, maidens. It's kind of a big surprise to men when they marry a girlfriend and then they get married and uh, when they get married and she has a child and then she becomes the mother and, and then he starts feeling like he's losing his girlfriend. Now he's married to the mother of, of his children. And, um, and that's where men need, often need a lot of help in, in the aging process and the developmental changes that, that, that take place. If a woman ages in a way to where she becomes bitter, brittle, and bitchy, it's a real problem for men. If she maintains her sweetness, that kindness, the empathy, and the compassion, it's a lot easier. If men can allow a woman to age gracefully and um, not be stuck in needing so many men, you know, I work with, you know, young fellows that essentially want to go from infatuation to infatuation. They want to, you know, just be with the most beautiful gals, you know, and sex is very important to them. And I say, look, I remember Simon Signore, you know, the, the great French actress at one point. She was 81 years old, and she was smoking a cigarette, and they asked her, they said, well, you know, what would you say? What, did you, what have you learned? What, what, what's really the most, like, important, significant thing that you learned? She took a drag off her cigarette, and she said, she said, I learned that passion is overrated. Compassion is what we need. And people who are in long-term relationships have to have more compassion, more tolerance, you know, more flexibility to allow for the changes that take place, or loyalty and commitment to relationship. We all make mistakes. We all screw up, you know. And we, I work with a lot of people that bring, come into my office and bring, you know, infidelities or different kinds of things, but they want to hang together. They want to get, get over that and, and, and recover from that. And so with guidance and coaching, you know, they, they can do that. Many people go on to have great relationships where they've been through a lot. You know, that's the nature. As M. Scott Peck said in The Road Less Traveled, life is difficult. Life is very difficult. It's very challenging. It presents a lot of obstacles and hurdles for us. But every time we, we're supposed to go up and over and, and become higher individuals, you know, expand our consciousness, become wiser uh, as a result of facing these problems in disguise. Did you see the movie Into the Wild? Um, I believe I did. Was that when he went off to uh, went up to Alaska and he was alone? Yeah. Yeah. I I actually um, read it, uh, and I think I might have seen the movie. Why does that inspire a man? A story like that. Wow. You know, I remember how moved I was by the movie Jeremiah Johnson, which I think is still Robert Redford's favorite movies. I think even more favorite than Butch Cassidy, you know. And that movie is an archetypal movie. Uh, Into the Wild is an archetypal movie because inherent within us is something that's very primal, very primitive. And that is, is that we're very much connected as hunters, you know, uh, to want to be independent and autonomous and to go off on, on an adventure, on a journey, to, ch to, to challenge ourselves, to see what we're made of. And uh, all those characters, for instance, in Jeremiah Johnson were just great. And um, the new movie, with uh, Leo DiCaprio, uh, you know, the name of it that uh, just has just been out, you know, where he's attacked by the bear. Can... Yes. That's like a modern day Jeremiah Johnson, you know? And uh, for, for men, they, they understand something by and through nature. They, they, they feel that, that deep sense of earthy connectivity. When we sit in men's retreats, 
at the same level. None of us are higher than anybody else. Or when we go into a sweat lodge, uh, or we go up on the ropes course, and we challenge ourselves, it, it allows us to feel more like a man. You know, that these are what men do. Not that women can't and they don't, obviously. We have, you know, more and more, you know, latitude for women, you know, the, to become Navy SEALs and to firefighters and police officers, you know, and all of that. But there's something innate to men which Bly referred to as the wild man, snatching the key from under the mother's pillow, unlocking the wild man and going off on a quest. In mythology, there's always a journey. There's always, you know, whether, you know, and who do we meet along the way? We meet the Cyclops. We meet the Sirens. You know, uh, we have to go after something, the Holy Grail, the Golden Chalice. But, you know, we, we, we've got to test ourselves. And then we've got to bring something back, whether it's like Herman Hesse's Siddhartha, you know, going off and then coming back, uh, or the, uh, the return of the prodigal son, you know. It's always about the mission that takes us away so that we, 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 we come closer to who we really are through being tested and surviving, and then the return. Thank you for this interview.